Good morning, Camelback family. My name is AC. I'm one of the pastors here at Camelback. And while we can't gather together in person, we're so glad to continue worshiping together all across the valley through this. Uh, and we're glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, if this is your first time, we'd love to hear from you. You can uh, let us know that you're there at info at camelbackbible.com. Just shoot us an email, and we'd love to get to know you a little bit better and connect. Uh, but if you're not new, we do have one announcement we just want to remind you of from last week. We have a marriage seminar this Wednesday night. So you can still sign up for that online at our church website, camelbackbible.com. We would love to have you join us. Couples, this is an opportunity for us to continue to work on our relationships uh, in the midst of this season. It is online, so if you're concerned about that, it's going to be over Zoom. And it's an opportunity for us still to continue to gather in some way on Wednesday night. We'd love to have you join us. Well, in Philippians 2, Paul writes that God uh, exalts Christ such that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And with that in mind, let's worship him today, today this morning. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-created one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the same. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus.
Well, we're scattered across the valley and across the world, but we can be shoulder to shoulder uh, when we go to God in prayer uh, before his throne. So let's do that together, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much that we can come to you this morning. And we praise you this morning because you are so good. The scriptures say, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty deeds of the Lord or tell all of his praise? And that's true, Lord. If we were here all day and if we spent all week here just talking about all the goodness that we've seen in our lives, that still wouldn't be enough time. Who could possibly describe all of your goodness? And so our hearts worship you today, and as we are scattered across the valley and around the world, we praise your name. And Lord, even as we do, even as we think about your goodness, we realize the sin that's in our own lives, that we are not good. We've responded to your goodness with evil. You created us in your image as your representatives to take care of each other and this world, and we haven't done that. We've sinned. So we confess to you our sinful thoughts, our sinful words, our actions, things we've done and left undone, and we lay them before you openly now, not trying to hide anything. And we come once again to the cross. And we remember that you are so good that you didn't turn your back on us, but instead you sent your son into this world to save sinners like us. And we thank you that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Your word says... that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds were healed. How good you are to us. You overcame evil with good at the cross. Lord, we want to come to you now with all of our requests, and because we know you're good, we can be confident as we bring our prayers to you. And so we pray for families that are getting used to another stage in this pandemic. And as kids aren't going to be heading back, many of them, but uh, at home, and parents are having to adjust to that and to uh, learn how to live uh, with this new startup for school, we pray that you would give grace to each family. We pray for marriages in our church, uh, which may be stressed because of the pandemic. It gets hard. And so we pray uh, that you will give husbands and wives love for each other. And we pray for the marriage uh, seminar that's coming up on Wednesday, that you'll use that to help us uh, grow in our love for each other and for you. Lord, we pray that you would give us strength as we wrestle with sins that are endemic to this particular season. Things, weeds that grow, particularly during this time of isolation. So we pray for those who are struggling with alcohol and those who are struggling Uh, with pornography and those who are uh, struggling with selfishness and with all the sins that can so easily grow up when we are isolated like this. We pray that you would give grace. Lord, we pray that you would be at work in our country. We see uh, violence and anger in our streets. We pray that the church would be at the forefront of this, bringing a message of reconciliation. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with their sexual identity, that you'll help them to rest in who you have made them to be. May they hear your words of love spoken over them. Lord, we pray for those who are in physical need. We think of Audrey. We think of Don and Connie and Fred and others who are known personally. For each one who needs a physical touch from you, we pray that you would be powerful and at work. Lord, we pray for those who are traveling. We ask that you would keep them safe on the road and give them rest on vacation. Lord, we had some unexpected news this week about our contemporary worship director. And so um, as we continue that search, we pray that you would lead us to the right person. And we pray that you would uh, continue to help us 
uh, worship you and find someone that's gonna, that you'd bring us someone who's going to help us grow together as disciples through music. Lord, we thank you so much that you are good. We can trust you to be good. We can see your goodness in our lives. Fill our hearts with a new sense of your goodness today, we pray. Amen. We're so grateful that we get to come and just rest with you today. God, we invite you to come and speak to us, Lord. Speak to our minds and hearts, Lord. And we pray that today you'd inspire and change, help us change the way that we live. Lord, help us tune our ears to you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, for... Uh leading these songs, and uh, we've got more music coming up at the end of the service. Um, if you're on our uh, email distribution list, you know that we had a change of plans for this week. We were planning on welcoming a uh, candidate for the contempor our contemporary worship director, 
and uh, we had some last minute developments um, that changed our plans, and so uh, we are resuming our search. So you can be praying for that um, as we continue to, uh, to look for the person that God has uh, to, to lead this particular service. Our music is a teaching ministry. We're helping God's word take root in our hearts through our music. And so uh, we're looking for someone that's going to be able to step in and, uh, and help us with that. And we're thankful to Elijah for uh, jumping in uh, today at uh, on short notice. Well, we're going to be looking at First uh, Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 13 through 22. So if you have your Bible, you want to open that up or pull it up on your phone. And uh, I will read that first, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. This is what God's word is to us this week. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, and as we're gathered in our living rooms or uh, maybe uh, sitting at a desk uh, watching online, uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit uh, will use this technology to help us hear your word. Help me to speak clearly as I should. Help us all to listen well. And we pray that you would change and transform us by the power of your word, applied by your Holy Spirit to our hearts. Amen. Well, if you've ever water skied, you may know uh, the name Correct Craft Ski Nautique. Correct Craft is the larger, the largest family-owned boat manufacturer in the world. But they went through a serious crisis when the company was still young in 1957. Back in 1957, Correct Craft won a military contract to manufacture 3,000 fiberglass assault boats. And as they were discussing the contract, the government, the government inspector who had come down to their plant in Florida quietly noticed that there wasn't an expense account included in the budget. He was fishing for a bribe. Well, Walt Maloon, the president of Craft, Craft is a, was a great Christian man, and he ignored that hint. And two weeks later, he would find out just what his integrity would cost him. As the boats began coming off the production line, this inspector, who had been fishing for a bribe, started marking off perfectly good boats as defective. All told, he marked off 640 of the 3,000 boats defective, over 20% of the production. And that left Crecraft in debt to the tune of $1.5 million in 1957 dollars. And so they were forced to file for bankruptcy. The fact of the matter is, sometimes we do suffer for doing the right thing. Your integrity, your goodness, your godliness can cost you. 
And it's not just in business. You might go out of your way to help your sister. And then she turns the family against you. Or you might help a neighbor and then he steals from you. Or you serve at church and maybe someone gossips about you. Or you welcome someone new to your group at work. You make sure you go out of your way to make sure to, to, that they feel welcome. And then they take the credit for the project that you led. Or I know of a missionary family that moved to La Paz, Bolivia with their young children. And shortly after they got there, their young daughter ended up contracting a disease that she never would have gotten if they had stayed home in America. And she died. We suffer sometimes for doing the right thing. We saw last week that the scriptures command us to do good no matter what. That was back up in chapter 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. God wants us to do good no matter what. That's what our lives are supposed to be like. But the fact is, that is a tall order, especially when you know it might cost you. So how can you keep on doing good even when you know you might be treated unfairly? That's what Peter is talking about here. How to keep doing good when you may be done wrong for doing right. And we can summarize his instructions under two headings, and they correspond to the two paragraphs that are probably in your Bible. First, hold on to your confidence, and that's in verses 13 through 17. And then look to Christ, that's in verses 18 through 22. Hold on to your confidence and look to Christ. Confidence and Christ. Hold on to your confidence. Don't waver. Believe what you believe. When you're worried that you might have to pay a price for doing the right thing, that's when you need to hold on to what you know is true. Hold on to your confidence. Be confident that God is in control. That's the point of verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for doing what is good? Now, at first, that might seem like he's saying you usually won't get into trouble if you do the right thing. If you don't speed, you don't get a ticket. That might be on the face of it what it seems like he's saying here. That's very true, but there's more. We need to read this in context. He's following up on what he just said in verse 12, when he was quoting Psalm 34. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And the word harm in verse 13 is the same root as the word evil in verse 12. We're supposed to be reading these together. In fact, we could translate verse 13. Who then is there to do evil to you if you are zealous for what is doing good? Think about it. If God's eyes really are on you, if he's watching over you, if he really does hear your prayer, if his face really is set against everyone who does evil and all their plans and all their intentions, if those things are true, then who is going to do evil against you? What evil plan can succeed against you? That's the point of verse 13. It's much the same thing that the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? Our enemies may hurt us, but they can't harm us. It may be painful, 
But nothing that God allows in his wisdom and goodness is ultimately going to be for your, for evil, for you. In fact, Psalm 34, which Peter had just quoted, gives us this great encouragement in the verses that are right after the ones he quotes. Listen to what the psalmist says. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all, not some, all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, and isn't that true? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can do evil if you are zealous for doing good? God is in control. Be confident of that. And be confident that God will bless you. That's the point of the next verse, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, which you very well may, you will be blessed. God has a way of taking the things that are intended to harm us, the rumors that are spread about us, the slander that is said against us, the harm that is done to us. He's got a way of taking those things and turning them to our good in his plan. You see, people are thinking they're doing one thing, but God's ways are above our ways, and he is able to take the dark threads of evil intentions and weave them into the beautiful tapestry that is your life. Sometimes we see how this works in this life. We see God's blessing in this life. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. They did him evil. They harmed him. But near the end of their lives, Joseph told his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. And in fact, Joseph was the second in command in all of Egypt. And that never would have happened without his brothers doing what they did. God was working. God is playing the long game. And you can count on him to bless you. Lisa and I have a friend who uh, was a successful businessman, and he uh, was able to quit his job and work full-time on the pastoral staff of a large church. And it was really a wonderful thing. We saw things were going really well for the first year. They were happy. They were fulfilled. Their ministry was effective. But then things soured. And it was painful. And it was clear that they couldn't stay through no fault of their own. And we watched them process through that. It looked like they were being kicked out but in reality, God was kicking them upstairs. This difficulty was his path to promotion. This man that we know became the president of a Christian college, and he became involved in the boards of a number of businesses and a Christian ministry and in the arts, and now he is leading an international ministry, and he would not have been set on this trajectory that has been very fulfilling for him if it wasn't for that hard chapter at that large church. Sometimes we see God's blessing in this life. And we see how he's using the hard things to do good. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes someone may go to the grave. Someone that you love and know may go to the grave without their name ever being vindicated. And you don't see how what happened to them could ever have been turned for good. Now God may be working in secretly and quietly inside their hearts in ways that you can't see. 
Maybe he's making them holy in some way. Maybe he's growing a flower of faith that can't grow in any other soil than in the difficulty that they're going through. And maybe his blessing is waiting until after they die and they're in heaven. Sometimes things don't work out so well in this life, but we can be sure that God will bless in the future. The Bible says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And if you love Jesus, that is true. It will be worth it. You will experience his blessing. The scriptures say this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. That's what God's doing. Be confident that God will bless you. It may be where you can see it in this life. It may be in the life to come, but it's coming. Be confident and do good. And be confident in Jesus. He goes on to say, Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Now this really is an amazing verse because he's quoting Isaiah chapter 8. And in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah the prophet is talking about uh, actually honoring the Lord of hosts as holy. Peter takes that verse that's about the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and says, This is about Jesus. Jesus is the God of Israel. He is the Lord of hosts. And so Peter says, in your hearts, set apart, honor Christ the Lord as holy. It's an amazing verse about Jesus Christ. Fear is an enemy that we suffer when we suffer for doing good as Christians. We know the right thing to do, but all of a sudden we're afraid of what might happen, what people might think, what people might say, what we might lose. And so we can't do what's right anymore because fear has gripped us. Peter knew this full well. You remember when uh, Jesus was going to the cross, the night that he was betrayed, Peter followed him into the court of the chief priests during his trial. And there a servant girl, a teenage girl came up to him and said, aren't, one of you, aren't you one of his disciples? And this big burly fisherman, Peter, his heart was gripped by fear and he denied even knowing Jesus three times. He wilted. He knows exactly what he's talking about here when he says, have no fear of them because he experienced that fear. The antidote to the fear of man and to the fear of what might happen is the fear of God. More specifically, Peter tells us to honor Christ the Lord as holy. Fear him. Recognize him for who he is. Christ has all authority. Look with me at the end of the chapter, what he says about Jesus, that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. The great secret is that if you fear God, if you fear Christ, you will be fearless in this life. A few weeks after Peter wilted before a servant girl, he stood bravely in front of the same Jewish council that condemned Jesus. What had happened in the meantime? What turned this this man who collapsed into a man who was so courageous? Well, Jesus rose from the dead. That's what happened. And Peter spent 40 days with him. He knew he was alive. He knew that he had been raised, proving that he was the son of God and that he was now sitting at the right hand of God, ruling over everything in the universe. The fear of Christ drove every other fear from his heart. It'll be the same for you too. Set Christ apart in your heart as holy. 
And with this confidence, each crisis is an opportunity to tell others about Jesus. If you bless those who mistreat you, if you do good consistently, even when people are unfair to you, it won't be long before people start asking why. Why do you do this? It makes no sense. How can you do this? That's why Peter says in verse 15, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. How can you do this? How can you live this way? Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. What hope do you have that allows you to do good even when you might suffer for it, that allows you to hold on to your integrity and do what's right, to bless people who curse you? What kind of hope do you have? Well, Peter's already talked about this hope. Look back with me at chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to what, how he started this book. At the beginning of this letter, he said this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. What hope do you have? You have the hope of an inheritance in heaven, safe, kept for you. You have the hope that God's power is guarding you right now. And your hope is as sure as the resurrection of Christ. So you have great hope. And so when someone comes to you and says, how can you do this? How can you live this way and be good consistently? That's a time when you can say, you know what? I've got a life that's even bigger than this one. I'm living for something beyond this world. I know Jesus, and he's promised to reward me, and he's with me right now, and he's the one that gives me the strength to live this way. You're talking about the hope that you have, the hope that's living inside of you that allows you to live such a godly life. Now, when someone asks you about why you're living that way, this is not the time to get nasty, because you'll be tempted to say, huh, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that God's face is against you right now, and for all this stuff that you've done to me, you're going to suffer. That won't get you very far. Now is not the time to be angry and arrogant. This isn't the time to get even. This is the payoff. That moment is the payoff for all the times when you consciously and intentionally did what was right. You've been plowing the ground with your godly life. And when that person comes to you with a question, their heart is open to hear what you have to say, now is the time to talk about Jesus gently and respectfully. Keep doing good with your words. Point them to Jesus. He saved a sinner like you, so surely he can save the person that's talking to you. Be confident. Hold on to your confidence. Your confidence is rooted in Christ. And then look to Christ. That's the second paragraph. Hold on to your confidence. Look to Christ. That's how you're going to keep doing good even when people may do you wrong. Jesus is our great example of suffering for doing the right thing. 
This means that we need the gospel when people treat us unfairly and when we're hurt for doing what's right. Now, as we look at verses 18 through 22, these are some of the most complicated verses in the entire New Testament. In fact, a couple months ago, I called uh, John Dalhousie, who's a prof up at Phoenix Seminary, and I asked him to preach uh, in the month of August, in a, in a couple weeks. And um, I told him we were going through First Peter, and it would be great if he could pick up one of the texts that we've already got sketched out. And he said to me, yeah, I bet you're giving me the one that's about baptism at the end of chapter 3, aren't you? And uh, I said, no, actually, I'm going to tackle that one. But he knew full well it's, it's notorious for being hard. So we're not going to solve every problem in these verses, and I'm not, I'm not even going to try to walk through all the different options for interpreting it. Instead, I want to track through these verses to see what they say about Christ, because that's what I think Peter is doing here. He's showing us Christ as our example when we suffer harm for doing good. So we're going to see what this says about Christ's death, about Christ's preaching, about Christ's resurrection, and about Christ's glory. He starts with the unjust death of Christ, verse 18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus' death was the most unfair, unjust event in the history of the world. He is the perfect, pure, spotless Son of God. He didn't deserve to die. He was righteous. We were unrighteous. We do deserve to die. But instead of us dying like should have happened, he died in our place. So his unfair, unjust death had meaning. He was doing us good, bringing us back to God. We were God's enemies, rebels, alienated. We couldn't go home. God was rightly angry at us. The dark cloud of his judgment was heavy and ominous above us, ready to break with anger on our heads. But instead, he died in our place. He was our substitute. The punishment that we deserved was on him. So his once for all death bought our salvation. He was the one great and final sacrifice. And now we have open access to God. We can come into his presence as dearly loved children. Just this past week on Thursday morning, I was sitting in my office working on my sermon, and I put a note up on my door so that people know that I'm you know, diving deep in sermon prep so that the staff can hold off and not necessarily come knocking when, when there's, when, immediately when there's a question. And... I was sitting focused on the text and all of a sudden my door just opened and someone came barging right in. And who was it? It was my daughter. She had come by the church to say hi to me. She can just come walking right into my office whenever she wants. Why? Because she's my child. That's the access we have to God. We were reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ so we can come to him anytime. The unjust death of Christ. He suffered for our good. And he also spoke for our good. We see the preaching of Christ in verse 19 and 20. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. This is a difficult verse, but I think we can explain it simply. Let's start with Noah and who Noah was. You probably know the story of Noah building the ark. He was the only good and righteous man that God found on the earth. And so when God was planning on bringing judgment on all of humanity, God saw him as the one righteous man and said, 
you build an ark and I'm going to save you and your family from the waters of judgment in this ark. But not only did he build an ark, he wasn't just a builder, he was also a preacher. The scriptures call him a preacher of righteousness. In fact, Peter says that in his second letter, 2 Peter 2.5. So while Noah was building the ark, he was also speaking to the people of his day, saying, judgment is coming. Turn, repent, live a good life. Honor God, follow him. He was preaching. And that's what's being referred to here. They didn't obey. They didn't obey the preaching of Noah when he spoke truth about God. But here's the thing, Noah was not just speaking on his own. These weren't just his words that he was coming up with. Christ was speaking through him. The Spirit of Christ spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament, including Noah. We saw this earlier in 1 Peter. If you look back at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he talks about this very idea. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glory. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And he spoke through the Old Testament prophets. So when Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, Noah spoke for God, the Spirit of Christ was speaking through them. And that's what it means when it says, in which, that is, in the Spirit, he had gone and and, uh, proclaimed uh, and preached to the spirits in prison. These spirits are in prison now. They disobeyed then when Noah preached, and they've been in bondage ever since. They heard Christ speaking through Noah. They disobeyed, and for all those centuries, they had been in bondage. He preached back then to those who are still in prison now. Now, what's the point? Why is Peter saying this? The same Jesus who died and rose again spoke through Noah. He was speaking and preaching all throughout history. Noah was just the beginning. Jesus spoke boldly through the prophets for centuries, knowing that he would go to the cross. He did good. He called people to follow God, even though he knew that doing good would cost him. It would cost him the incarnation coming to this earth. It would cost him years of opposition in his ministry on earth. It would cost him his life on the cross. For centuries he spoke, just like he asks us to speak. And so when we look at the example of Christ, this Christ who spoke through the Old Testament prophets, that gives us courage when someone says, why are you living this way? Why do you continue to do good when people harm you? You think to yourself, my Lord Jesus spoke when he knew that it would cost him. I'm going to speak now too. If he was so brave, you and I can be brave. He foretold his own sufferings and death. I can speak in his name now too. Christ is our example. His speaking, his preaching inspires us and encourages us. Peter then turns to the resurrection of Christ. He says in verse 28, persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
The flood was God's judgment on a sinful world, and it was a sign that was pointing forward to the final judgment when God would deal with sin. He doesn't put up with sin forever. And the flood that happened so long ago was like the coming attractions at the beginning of a movie. This is what's going to be happening at the end, this level of judgment. Noah and his family were saved in the safety of the ark. This was a sign that God would not sweep away his people with everyone else, but he would save them when he judged the world. And so the salvation of Noah and his family in the ark was pointing forward to the salvation that God, what God would do through Jesus on the cross. He would save his people through Christ so that they wouldn't come under the judgment that was coming on this entire world. So the ark was pointing forward to what God would do in Christ, saving his people through judgment. Baptism is looking back on what God has done in Christ. So they're both pointing to the same thing, but from different directions. That's why he can say that baptism corresponds to God saving people through the ark. Both were focused on Christ. One was foretelling, one is looking back on it. Now, why does he say that baptism saves you? We know full well that in other parts of the New Testament, we're saved by faith apart from anything that we do. And we're saved not because we're baptized, but because we trust in Jesus. So what is he saying here? Well, in the New Testament, people were baptized immediately when they believed. And you can see this throughout the book of Acts. And so in practice, this was all part of just one event. Conversion and baptism were just right away. When Paul and Silas preached to the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, right away everyone was baptized. And so when he says baptism now saves you, he's not talking about baptism in isolation from faith in Christ. He's looking at that entire event as one thing. You believe and are baptized. You believe Jesus rose from the dead. You pledge yourself to God. You're baptized, immersed in water. And so he's referring to that entire experience here. And then when that happens, when you trust in Christ, you're experiencing the full salvation that Noah's ark pointed forward to. His family was saved through God's judgment in the flood, and you're being saved through the final judgment when he will end our rebellion once and for all and judge our sinful world. And Peter ends with a focus on the glory of Christ, a strong note of encouragement pick up at the end of verse 21 he says the resurrection of jesus christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of god with angels authorities and powers having been subjected to him what an encouraging verse jesus suffered unfairly but that was not the end of the story god raised him god exalted him God put him on the throne of heaven. And now he has authority as king and ruler over every being in the universe. And this tells us at least three vital things. First, God is able fully to bless you even after you die. It's not like a football game where the fourth quarter ticks to a close and then game over, nothing else matters. No, death is not the end. Death is just the beginning. These 80 years that we might have in this world is a blink of an eye compared to all God has for us in eternity. Death was not the end for Jesus, and death is not the end for you, Christian. The blessings that he has for you after death are not second-rate leftovers, but in fact, that is when true blessing begins. 
Listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us who are in Christ Jesus. This means that in eternity future, God has a wealth of grace for you, a wealth of blessing. The vindication that you might experience in this life, the blessings you might experience in this life are an appetizer. It's just getting you ready, setting your palate for everything he has for you in heaven. That's when the true blessing begins. So when you see someone you love and you see that life didn't turn out the way that you think it should, and they did what was right, and they suffered for it, and nothing was ever made right. Death is not the end. God's got blessing in eternity. That'll be more than worth it. We also notice that since Jesus rose again, you can be sure you will rise again. You were born to a living hope through Jesus' resurrection, so his life is a guarantee of your life forever. And then this also tells us that this same Jesus who died for you is ruling for you. Your future is completely secure. Your brother is on the throne of the universe. That means that the game is rigged in your favor. You can't possibly lose. The same Jesus who loves you and gave his life for you is now ruling over everything for you. What do you have to worry about? If you take all this to heart, you are going to be able to do good even when people turn against you. You'll be able to do right even when you've been done wrong because you're confident and you're looking to Christ. When Kraft went through their bankruptcy in 1957, the court ruled that they had to repay 20 cents on the dollar. But Walt Maloon decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what's right. Our creditor has loaned us a certain amount of money, and we're going to return that amount of money, even though the court says we don't have to. It took them 27 years until 1984 fully to pay off all their debts. After a few years, they were sending checks to the widows and children of some of their creditors who received those checks, sometimes with tears in their eyes, and said, we never thought we would see this. 27 years of suffering for this company because they wouldn't pay a small bribe to an inspector. They suffered for doing what's right. But God blessed. And now Correct Craft actually owns 10 separate boat companies and has been amazingly successful. Walt Maloon didn't know that God would do that. And God didn't have to do that. He was a follower of Jesus. And he decided, I'm going to do the right thing. Even when I don't have to. I'm going to do good to my creditors even when wrong has been done to me. You see, we're Christians. That's what we do. We do good. We do good to everyone even when it hurts. That's how Jesus lived and that's how we live. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you and that you give us these challenging words. And we thank you that you are with us, that you're walking beside us, and that you know. And so, Lord, we trust you. We pray that you'll help us to have our confidence fully in you. Help us to follow Jesus and do good to everyone always. Amen. Yeah.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, I sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Your rich in love and your slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your holy name, and on that day. My strength is failing. The end draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise and Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, oh, I will worship your holy name, Lord, I worship your holy name.
the darkness, your loving kindness taught through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. Such great a mercy, what heart could fathom such endless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is broken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. The beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the Word who set me free. Hallelujah. God has been so good to us. And one of the ways that we worship him is that we respond through giving and supporting gospel ministries so that the name of Jesus can be made famous in the valley and throughout the world. The psalmist says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits for, to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. We could never pay back God for what he's done for us. 
but instead we celebrate the gospel and we want to see Jesus' name lifted up. And that's what our tithes and offerings go to. Thank you so much to all of you who have been faithful with online giving and sending in checks to support gospel ministry here at Camelback. And we continue to uh, 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 rely on those as, uh, as we do our work here. Well, let's ask for God's blessing as we go into this coming week. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen, and go with God this week.